Uh, first of all, like I say, I'd like, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so glad that I get to humbly share things from my heart. Uh, the first step, of course, was deciding how I was going to do it. Uh, was I going to stand up here and give you a BuzzFeed type list of top 12 ways to gospel impact in my life via Disney gifts? <laughs> uh, decided that wouldn't be the best way. Uh, too many things could go wrong with technology, copyright laws and such. But I decided instead that I would simply just share from my heart and share uh, something that's been uh, really integral in my life. Uh, things that were, are simple, straightforward, um, but still very profound. Still have a very huge impact on my life. So, um, I want to start by asking you to feel, or ask you, has there ever been a time you felt like a captive to something? Or even imagining what it would be like to feel captive to something. To feel bound, like you couldn't move, perhaps you're confined to, like, in a small space. Uh, I'd like to share a story uh, about a friend of mine who, who felt this very way. Uh, he's a really good guy. Walking with the Lord, pursuing Christian community, uh, and doing what he could to live a life worthy of the gospel. But deep within his heart and within his mind, there's this battle raging. A battle that nobody else could see. Sinful thoughts of negative self value and the hard reality of life screamed loudly against the truth that his friends and his family were trying to speak to him. And one way this struggle manifests itself, this self, is by ejecting the community of others, going off to lonely places, carrying a knife in his pocket, just in case uh, it, the feeling overtook him, and the thought of relieving the pain by harming himself would provide temporary relief. He would disappear for hours on end because of this. Didn't know this until after the fact. He disappeared for hours, missing commitments, not answering his phone. He had no idea where he was. And I look back on that time, and I think how hard it must have been for him to deal with that internally before he needed to to anybody. He needed to know and believe that a deliverer had set him free from captivity. I'd like to take a moment to pray before I get into this. Uh, Father, we come to you uh, seeking that you teach to our hearts tonight. Pray that your spirit would speak through me, truthfully. Uh, I call my names a little bit. And I pray that uh, people can be blessed by hearing the truth you believe. Amen. Right. Uh, so you can turn to your Bibles, search on your apps. I'll put it up on the screen too. To uh, Romans 7 21 is where we're going to start. We're going to go from 7 21 to 8 2. Uh, as you turn there, I'll provide you a little bit of context. Uh, Paul was uh, invited to the church in Rome, uh, and he has just finished talking about the old law, the law of the Old Testament, uh, the way it was before Jesus got here, if you didn't know. And he's already stated that the old law is good. It, it shows us the standard that we're supposed to strive for, it gives us the do's and the don'ts, but it has one flaw in that though it, it tells us these things, it provides no hope and no solution. Instead, it just points out, uh, points out our sin to us, makes it known to us. So it is good, but there's, there's no hope there. So picking up in verse 21, I'm going to take a drink first. I almost missed my hand. Okay. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin and murder within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
Paul refers to a couple different laws here. Uh, very, I think, classy language. Uh, but it makes it hard for me to understand these, so I thought it would be worth explaining a little bit. Um, there, the two laws here are the law of sin and death, and God's law, uh, later referred to as the law of spirit. The law of sin and death is the habitual tendency to fall short of God's perfection. Our aptitude to sin in which we are living. We are born sinners. God's law is simply God's desire for our life. But as I said before, it's a standard to which we are doomed to fail. My first point, because of, based on this, is that sin is a part of us, and it battles to dominate us. Did you know there's a spiritual battle raging inside of you? Good versus evil has been waging a war since time began. And the moment you got here on this earth, your heart, soul, and mind became its most recent battlefield. In verses 21 to 23, Paul talks about his personal experience that he can sense the evil in him at all times. And if you've decided to follow Jesus, you've surely heard, and as I've already said, we're born with this sin. Sin is our natural disposition to lie, cheat, steal, whatever it is for you. To live with a selfish ambition to satisfy our satisfaction through anything other than what God has desired for us to find our satisfaction in, which is Himself. And Paul has said earlier in this letter, in Romans 3.23, which I believe I put on the slide as well, says, For everyone has sinned, and we all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. There's not a single person in this room that this is an exception to. And in fact, there's only one person in history that is the exception to this. And he was literally God. So there is no hope for us. There's no hope for us to fulfill this on our Needless to say, this is terrible news. Terrible news that we're born into this, this context, into this doomed state. Because of this, uh, because of this as believers, we know what we want to do as believers, but we're born into this. And our hearts do desire to glorify God. Try to keep this in place. To glorify God with how, our, how we live our lives, but we can't because we're born failures. This is harsh but true news. And to make it even worse, to put the pessimistic frost, frosting on this already depressing cake here, uh, we can't save ourselves. We just can't. Uh, in my own life, here's how I looked. Uh, all through my life, all through high school, I said I followed Jesus. I acted towards my family and my friends as if I did. I was involved in youth group. Um, I, I did all the right things. But I had a few girlfriends in high school. Uh, all which were very nice, but none of them followed Jesus. Uh, being a high school boy who liked this, uh, who liked girls, I didn't necessarily care. And so the way our relationship looked, we were doing things and acting in ways that were very glorifying to God. I just said that, my mom's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll get to why it's okay. continually prevail. 
And I was repeating this same cycle of sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness, sin. And I felt so stuck. And I felt like I was this messed up person who could never, ever break this chain. I remember certain points in my life thinking that this is sin, but this is happening. Leaving me thinking that I was truly the wretched man. This brokenness in the area of relationships outside of God's standard and conducting ourselves in ways that is not how God wanted dating relationships to look weighed heavily on me. And it affected other areas of my life too. I could see the relationship with my friends and family becoming more strained. I felt stretched thin at school. And the faith that I claimed I had felt weaker and weaker as I continued to sin more and more. I want to take a moment now to ask you what things in your life are holding you captive? What are you seeing a cycle of in your life? I would highly encourage you to take a good look at yourself and determine what that is. But there's hope. My next point. Jesus, our deliverer, frees us from captivity. We are disgustingly aware of our own sin. Because of knowing God's commands and the Holy Spirit within us, we're convicted and we can see our sin. And we're even aware that we cannot defeat this sin on our own. But here's the good news. We don't have to defeat anything on our own. Because sin has been defeated for us. The death of Jesus bridged the gap that separated us from God, who created us to live in perfect fellowship with Himself. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. In the middle of our confusion and in the middle of our failures, we can trust in the victory that Jesus' death promised us. He comforts his disciples in John 16, 30, 33, in saying, uh, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Um, sorry, I had a different name, but that's okay. And he surely is overcome. The same Jesus that we know is overcome is the same Jesus who came down to our level, took sin on toe to toe, and won every time. I'm a man and I struggle to not sin like every five minutes. Let me, let me walk you through a short version of my morning. I wake up and the first thing I do is say, I don't want to go student teach today. <laughs> And then I walk into the bathroom where my mom is already getting ready because I live at home because I'm a student teacher. And I say to her, I really don't want to go to school today. <laughs> <laughs> and so the cycle repeats every day since January. Uh, I'm done next week. But <laughs> <laughs> I can't go more than five minutes without grumbling, complaining. Waking up in the morning and realizing I've shirked the evening's responsibilities from the evening before. But how great is He, the Word that became flesh, so that God could be among His people for the expressed purpose to know Him once again. Making a way for His favorite creation of perfect fellowship again. And after about 30 some years, again, normal man, Five minutes, hard enough, but after 30 years of living a life perfectly, he was killed. A perfect sacrifice for my sake and for yours. And God took this bloody, beaten, dead tissue that had been just laying there for three days and raised it back to life. And sometimes I can't believe that I hear that message and think something to myself like, Yeah, but I sin a lot. Is, is God who did that, who raised a dead man from the grave, can he not also say, I forgive you? 
that no longer holds any weight over your life. Because in accepting Jesus as our Savior, we die to this old law of sin and death. And did you know? Did you know that those of you who are in Christ right now have died before? You're no longer the same person you were when you arrived on this earth. Paul says in Galatians, for through the law of the Spirit, I'm putting in so many sense, the Lord of the law of the Spirit, I died to the law of sin and death so that I might live for God. And how great is this news that we are new creations in Christ, broken free from sin. And instead, we've been set free, given the life, and our chains have been broken. They're taken off. And now there is no more condemnation. There is no more condemnation. And when I said earlier that the one to speak in the heart, it was simple, true, that I needed to hear. These are the words that Blake from two, three, four years ago needed to hear. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, we are aware of our sin, and we can know that it is paid for. But if you're anything like I was, you still feel stuck. Here are a few examples of what this passage is not saying. The passage is not saying there's condemnation there, but it's being held back from you. Maybe you feel like God loves you so much, but He knows you're messed up, and so He's letting you go. He's letting, he's letting you in anyway. It's, here's another thing it's not saying. God knows that you sin, but He's cool with that. God's not okay with your sin. God is perfect and cannot be in the presence of sin. But here's what it is saying. There is literally no more penalty for the sins you have committed in the past if you're in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you again. What's keeping you captive? What haven't you let go of? What do you think is too much to give up? What do you have hidden inside your heart that you think will be too much of a burden to others or for yourself to handle? To bring to the light. Maybe you struggle with sexual sin. Or maybe you struggle with getting approval from others as Eric shared with us last week. Maybe you feel a bit of a conviction being involved in the party scene. And maybe you're like my friend who had thoughts of low self-esteem, low value, and even entertain the idea of harming yourself. Whatever it is, here's what I want you to know happened to your sin when Christ died. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. It's as if we have a ledger. If Jesus had a ledger of everything we've done wrong, it's totally blank. Whereas ours is filled, it's like eight point font, single space, smushed together in margins to the edge. It's just totally filled up. Totally filled up. And Jesus sees your ledger of wrongs and says, I'll trade you. I got that one. Um, my, my Jesus is broken. <laughs> okay. And Jesus took all those sins, warranting the punishment of death, and you know what he did? He died. He took it upon himself, gave us his totally clean record. And so now the righteousness of a totally sinless life is credited to us. And God doesn't look at us and say, that's Blake who sinned in the past, and I love him anyway. He says, that is my son who is holy and blameless. And I'm glad that he's here with me now. Those of you who put your faith in Jesus and are sitting there thinking you're still in your chains, you're not. Your chains have been broken and they're long gone. But if you're still seeing a cycle of failing by the power of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, throw them off, get up and walk away. Let me just say really quickly in here, maybe you're just checking out for it. 
It's a little late in the year, but thanks for coming anyway. If you're listening to me and you haven't accepted Jesus, placed your faith in Him, acknowledged Him as your Savior, can I encourage you to do that? To make that decision because Jesus, the Deliverer, who sets us free from the captivity of our sin, He wants to free you too. Maybe you're like I was. You've accepted Jesus, but you still feel like you're in bondage. I want to let you know these are the words that changed my life. They brought me out of the sins that I believed that I was stuck and doomed to repeat the same cycle of transgressions and sins over and over again. I can take you to the exact spot in the atrium where I heard them for the first time. I could show you the couch I was sitting in, but they took them out. <laughs> And when I heard them for the first time, I was sitting there with my disciple in my sophomore year. Um, probably around this time, if I remember right. And I started sobbing like a baby inside, outside of John Jesus. <laughs> and people see me, but I don't care. Because of all the weight that I have been carrying of my sin, the broken relationships, the never-ending cycle, Finally, it was taken away from me. No longer did I have to feel stuck. No longer did I have to go on with praising God with one hand and sinning with the other. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit empowers each one of us to shake off the chains that were holding us down. This is when I first understood and I knew then, and I know now, that these condemning feelings were lies that the enemy was feeding me, and I was buying it too. Here's some truth that you can remember in those moments, if you feel the way that I felt. Jesus, our deliverer, has set us free from that captivity. The life you now live is for His glory, and it's good. It's a good life. Very straightforward. I'm ready to conclude you guys. <laughs> so let me ask you a few questions. Have you decided to follow Jesus and let him save you from your sin? If you have, what's holding you captive? What lies are you stand what lies about your standing with God do you believe? Do you think you're stuck? Do you truly believe that you're forgiven? You understand that some of this might be confusing all these different laws or, or whatever. But I would highly suggest that if you have questions or if you want to take another step, find me, find anyone to talk to. You. Because this is, this is simple but profound and sometimes heavy on our hardest stuff. That takes time and sometimes a good cry about it. Process, if you're like me. <laughs> but this is something that is life or death for your eternal soul, and the stakes could not be higher. So I, I highly encourage you that if you're wanting to take the next steps or want to respond to any of these questions, ask me about anything that I've said, please do that. Even if you think I made no sense and you want to tell me that, do that. I would like to talk about it. So, as I close in prayer, I'll invite uh, the band back up. That's what's next. I don't know how many of you are going to Dear God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that there is no more condemnation. Not that it's being withheld. Not that you're choosing to let us slide in any way, but God, there is literally no reason we can't be in perfect fellowship with you. Thank you for sending your Son. We thank you that he's paid for our sins, past, present, and future. Lord, we pray that you bless the rest of this evening as we, we join the band in worship. We pray that you speak to our hearts through this worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.